Hello, welcome to another tutorial in ME Review. Today, I will be discussing probability and statistics. If you want to know more about algebra, trigonometry, solid and analytic geometry, and engineering calculus, you can subscribe to this channel and watch the other videos. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to recall the fundamental concepts and principles in probability and statistics, list important formula and equations in probability and statistics, and apply concepts, principles, and formula or equations in solving worded problems in probability and statistics. This will be the outline of my presentation. Let's first start with probability. Probability is defined as E over S, where P is the probability of an event occurring, E is the number of successful outcome, and S is the number of total possible outcome. As you can observe, the probability is between 0 and 1. Let us have an example. There are five sticks measured 1 cm, 2 cm, 3 cm, 4 cm, and 5 cm. If three sticks are randomly picked, then what is the probability that the three sticks form a triangle? So in this problem, we are looking for the probability of forming a triangle, P, defined as the number of outcomes divided by the total outcomes. So, the number of outcomes is the number of triangles that can be formed, while the total outcomes is the total possible combination of the sticks. Our first step in solving this problem is to solve the total possible outcome. For combination, which is an arrangement of the selection of objects regardless of the order, the total possible combination can be calculated as n combination r. In this problem, there are five sticks, and out of that five sticks, we are going to create three combinations. That's why we have five combination three. So the total possible combination is 10. Take note also that we disregard order here. So they can be uh, combined in whatever order. The step two is to solve the number of triangles that can be formed. From Suarez inequality, for triangles to be formed, the sum of the two sides must be greater than the third side. If you're going to list the 10 possible combinations, we would have these combinations. And if you're going to look at these combinations, 10 combinations, there are three combinations that will uh, abide the Suarez inequality. The first one is the combination 2, 3, and 4, wherein the sum of the two sides is always greater than that of the third side. Same also for 3, 4, and 5, and 4, 5, and 2. For the other combination of sticks, we cannot create triangles. Thus, for the probability, we will have 3 possible outcome, 3 possible successful outcomes divided by the total possible outcome or combination, which is 10. In decimal, our answer would be 0 0.3. Or, there are 30% chance that the, the sticks that will be combined can form a triangle. So, that is a definition of probability. Let's move forward to a more uh, in-depth on probability. First, the complementary probability. Complementary probability in equation form can be written this way. We have P is equals to 1 minus P prime. In this, P is the probability that something will happen. P prime is the probability that something will not happen. Because if you're going to the inspect the definition of probability, 
the total probability of the event happening and not happening will always be 1. That is why the comp complementary of, of, of a probability is just is defined this way. Let us have an example. An urn contains 5 white, 3 black, and 2 red balls. In getting one ball, what is the probability that it is not red ball? So if we're going to look at the problem, we are looking for the complementary probability. The probability of that the ball is not a red ball is P not red, wherein our P not red is equals to 1 minus P red. So the probability that the ball is not red is equals to 1 minus the probability that the ball is red. For step number 1, we will solve the probability that the ball that will be drawn is red. So, going back to our definition of probability, it is just equals to the total number of successful outcome divided by the total possible outcome. For the successful outcome, we will count the total red balls. That's why we have total red balls divided by uh, total red balls divided by the total balls, which is the total possible outcome. In the urn, there are two red balls and the total balls, including the other colored balls, are 10. That's why the probability of getting red ball is 0 0.2. So, for the probability that we would not get a red ball, it will be the complementary, which is 1 minus 0 0.2. That is why the probability that the ball is not red is equals to 0 0.8 or there are 80% chance that the ball that we will get from the urn is not a red ball. Now that we know complementary probability, let's move forward to joint probability. Joint probability is divided into two. First, we have the joint probability for mutually exclusive events or events without common outcomes. Two events are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time. And it is defined as P, E or F is equals to P probability of F, where the probability of E is the probability of event A, E may happen. And P of F is the probability of event F may happen. Let us have an example. Find the probability of drawing either an ace or a king in a single draw from a deck of 52 playing cards. If we're going to look at this problem, it belongs to the joint probability of mutually exclusive events because the probability of drawing an ace does not affect the probability of getting a king. They do not have a common outcomes because there are separate cards for ace and there are also separate cards for king. So we will use our definition of joint probability for mutually exclusive event. The probability of drawing ace or king would be the probability of drawing an ace plus the probability of drawing a king. For the probability of drawing an ace, it is equal to the total ace cards divided by the total cards. The total ace cards, if you're going to count it from the deck of cards, is 4. And the total number of cards is 52. That's why the probability of drawing an ace card is 1 over 13. On the other hand, the probability of drawing a king is the probability or the total king cards divided by the total cards and that is 1 over 13. Therefore, the probability of drawing an ace or a king is equals to the sum of their individual probability. Thus, we have the probability of ace or king is equals to 2 over 13. So there, this is the chance that you can get an either ace or a king when drawing a card from the deck of cards. Aside from joint probability for mutually exclusive event, 
we also have a joint probability for non-mutually exclusive events or events with common outcomes. So if the events have common outcomes, then we will have probability E or F would be equal to the probability of event E may happen plus the probability of event F may happen minus the probability of event E and F. Let us have an example. Find the probability of drawing either an ace or a heart in a single draw from a deck of 50, 52 cards. If we're going to look at it in the first glance, you might have a mistake of looking this problem as mutually exclusive event. But if you're going to examine it, it is actually a non-mutually exclusive events or events that have common outcomes because there are actually ace that are heart. And they're also heart of ace. That is why they are non-mutually exclusive events. Or the outcome of the first may affect the outcome of the second. Thus, we will use our definition for the probability of non-mutually exclusive event. Using the formula, probability of drawing an ace card plus probability of drawing a heart minus the probability of drawing ace and heart. First, we solve for the probability of drawing an ace, and we already solved that in the previous example. For the probability of drawing a heart card, there are 13 heart cards out of the 52. That's why we have the probability is 1 fourth. On the other hand, for the probability of drawing an ace that is a heart is equals to 1 over 52 because there is only one ace heart out of 52 cards. Thus, the probability of drawing an ace or a heart would be 1 over 15 plus 1 over 4 minus 1 over 52. So, the probability of drawing an ace or a heart is 4 over 13. We understand joint probability, let's move forward to conditional probability. Conditional probability are for dependent events. This is when the outcome of one event affects the other. Or we can read that as the probability of an event A occurred and event B occurred is equal to the probability of event A may happen times the conditional probability of B given A has occurred. Or what would be the probability of an event B happening when event A has already happened? Let us have an example why it is called conditional probability. An urn contains three white balls and one black ball. Determine the probability of drawing two white balls in succession from the urn without replacing the ball after each drawing. If you're going to examine this, it belongs to conditional probability because when you draw the succeeding ball for the second attempt, for example, it would already be affected by the drawing of the first ball because here, we do not replace the ball, meaning the total possible outcome would be lessened. That is why it is a conditional probability or the effect of getting, of doing the first event to the second event. That is why we can use the probability of conditional. The probability of drawing two white balls in succession from the urn without replacing the ball after each drawing would be probability of uh, the event happening is equals to the probability of A times the probability of B when A has already happened. So in dealing with this kind of problem, we will first, we will solve each of these a quantity separately. So for the probability of A during the first drawing of the ball, we would have the total white balls divided by the total balls. For the total white balls, we have 3 and the total balls would be 4. 
That is why we have three fourths. For the probability of event B happening when A has already occurred, when you already draw the first ball and did not replace it, what will happen is that the total balls left after drawing the first ball would be 3. Also, when this A is successful, meaning you already did draw the white balls, meaning there will only be 2 balls left. That's why we have 2 here. 2 over 3. So, the probability of drawing two white balls in succession would be 3 4 times 2 3rd or 0 0.5, meaning there is a 50% chance that we would get two white balls in succession. Let's move forward to independent probability. So, this is the opposite of conditional probability wherein it is a dependent probability because the, the event, the second event is already dependent to the first event. For independent probability, the two events happening is not dependent of each other. So, our formula would be the probability of event A and B happening would be equal to the probability of event A happen times the probability of event B may Happen. For example, we have one bowl contains five white balls, two red balls, and three green balls. Another bowl contains three yellow balls and seven black balls. What is the probability of getting a red ball from the first bowl and yellow ball from the second bowl in a single draw from each ball? If you're going to examine this problem, there are two separate balls and we would uh, draw separately from each ball. Thus, the, the event of A would not affect the event B, or the drawing of the ball in the first ball would not affect the result of drawing another ball in the second ball. Thus, we can use the independent probability. We just multiply the probability that we get from each ball. For the probability of A happening, we would have the total red balls from the first ball divided by the total balls from the first ball, or that is 2 over 10. For the probability of event B happen, we would have the total yellow balls from the second ball divided by the total balls from the second ball, or that is 3 over 10. Thus, the probability of getting a red ball from the first ball and yellow ball from the second ball would be 2, 2 over 10 times 3 over 10, or that is 3 over 50. Let's move forward to the last topic under probability, which is the repeated trial probability. Repeated trial probability is defined this way, where P is the probability that event will occur exactly r times out of the n trials. Thus, you can use this formula when there are a number of trials and when you are looking for the probability that we would have a successful event, where p is the probability of success and q is the probability of failure. Let us have an example. A fair coin is tossed five times. What is the probability of getting exactly three heads? This is a fair coin, meaning there is no bias to the result. Thus, we cannot predict. Would We cannot also set in such a way that it would face up or down. So, uh, we can use our formula because if you're going to look at it, we will have uh, five trials because the coin would be tossed five times. And we are looking for the probability of getting exactly three heads. So the probability of getting exactly three heads can be obtained by using the repeated trial probability formula, which is n combination r times p to the power of r times q to the power of n minus r. So we substitute from our uh, problem. So the number of trials is 5. So that's why we have n is a cost of 5. R there is a number of getting exactly 3 heads out of the 5 trials. That's why we have r is equal to 3. 
the number of total uh, successful outcome, probability of getting a successful outcome is one half because there are only two outcomes and there is one head per that two outcomes. That's why you have one half to the power of r, which is three times the probability that you'd have unsuccessful or a failing outcomes, that is also one half. If you're going to notice, the sum of P and Q would always be a hundred or a 1.0 because uh, they are complementary of each other. So we also raise the Q to the power of N minus R. Thus, the probability of getting exactly three heads out of the five trials is 5 over 16. You can also use this formula when, for example, you have a multiple choice exam and you are looking for the probability of getting a particular score out of the total number of items, knowing that you know that there are multiple choice, for example, so out of the four choices, there is a one, there is a 0.25% of getting successful and 75% of getting N successful. So the same principle is uh, can be utilized. Now that we already have a review on probability, let's move forward to statistics. Beginning with the mean, mode, median, and range. Median is the middle number of a set of numbers arranged in numerical order. So in order to get the median, you will have to arrange the given set of numbers and look for what is in the middle. Mode, on the other hand, is the value which mo occur most frequently in a given distribution. Mean is the average value. Range is the difference between the largest and the smallest value of a set. Let us have an example. Find the mean, mode, median, and range of the set of numbers 2, 3, 3, 6, 6, 7, 7, 9, 10, 13, and 25. For the mean, what we're going to do is just to sum, to add all the numbers in the set and divide it with the total numbers. So there are 11 numbers, that's why we would have mean of 8.27. So the average of this number is, is 8.27. For the mode, we are looking for the numbers that occur most frequently. And there are actually, uh, this is actually trimodal because there are three numbers, uh, there are three numbers that occur most frequently, and that are C, 3, 6, and 7. For the median, that is equals to 7, because if you're going to look at it, if you're going to count, the, what is in the middle, it's actually 7. You can also notice that there are two numbers in the middle, so what you can do if that happens is to add them and divide by 2. Let's proceed to variance, standard deviation, and relative variability. Okay, let's proceed to variance. Variance is defined as the summation of the x minus m to the power of 2 divided by n. Or you can also use the formula this way. So it is actually dependent whether it is a sample or a population. V here is the variance. N is the number of samples. M is the mean and X is the, are the data sets. Standard deviation is just the square root of the variance and is the measure of the randomness or how scattered the numbers are. Relative variability is equals to the standard deviation divided by the mean. Let us have an example. What is the variance, standard deviation, and variability of the set of numbers 2, 4, 4, 5, 7, and 8? For the variance, we will use the formula that you can see flash on the screen. First, we have to solve for the mean, and that is just the sum of the numbers in the data set divided by the total numbers, and that is equals to 5. We substitute these values in our formula. Since we have here a summation, what it means is that we're going to use the this formula, but we would substitute all of the value of the data, which are 2, 4, 4, 
5, 7, and 8. And we divide them by the number of samples. We have 6. Thus, we have the variance as 4. For the standard deviation, it is just a square root of the variance. Thus, we have 2. For the variability, it is just the standard deviation divided by the mean. And that is 0 0.4. Finally, we can move forward to z-score. Z-score is the measure of the position that takes into account both the center and the dispersion of a given distribution of number. It is defined as x minus m divided by the standard deviation. Let us have an example. Suppose the attendance at a movie theater averages 780 with a standard deviation of 40. What z-score corresponds to an attendance of 835? So in this problem, we're given with the average, which is 780, the standard deviation of 40, and the number of attendance, which is 835, and we're looking for the z-score. So we simply substitute the given in the formula since they are already uh, direct, and we will get the z-score as 1.375. So the positive uh, value denotes that it is in the upper level in the uh, distribution. Upper level with respect to the average. Finally, the correlation coefficient. The total correlation coefficient can be uh, computed manually using this formula. Let us have an example. From the following tabulation, calculate the correlation coefficient between x and y. Correlation uh, is also a way for us to determine whether the, the first parameter has an effect on the second and vice versa. For example, whether the score of uh, the students in math has an effect on the score in English, and so on and so forth. So for the uh, correlation coefficient r or Pearson r, we would use this formula. We would tabulate the given and we'd solve each of this uh, x squared and y squared and also the product of xy respectively. And we'd also take the summation of each of this column here. So that it would be easier for us when we substitute them to our formula. So for this problem, our correlation coefficient is 0 0.9216. A uh, coefficient that is almost 1 means that it has a high uh, degree of correlation, meaning there is a great chance that these two variables affects each other or they are correlated to each other. So in this uh, lesson, we are able to, we're able to discuss probability and also statistics. The good thing about this subject is that there are a lot of calculator techniques that you can use without necessarily memorizing all those formulas.